Hello and welcome to News Click and People's Dispatch and we are here looking at the US election results. Now the elections were held on November 3rd, that's yesterday. The results are beginning to come out and it is a very, very close contest indeed. In fact, it does look like the results are not going to be clear today, even maybe by the end of today, India time. It may take a couple of days before some key states which are going to determine the results, the final results are announced there. So there's a lot of uncertainty, a much more closer contest than many people expected. And we have an excellent panel today. We are going to be looking at the numbers. We are going to be looking at the political implications. And of course, the US elections are so important for the rest of the world as well as every four years, people across the world sit and wonder, what does this mean for us? So we're going to be looking at all that. But first, here's a short video which explains what were the numbers involved? What was his stake in the US elections? Take a look. And welcome back to News Click and People's Dispatch. And we have a very interesting discussion ahead. In the studio, we have with us Bapa, who's going to provide the information about the data, very complicated numbers. And on Zoom with us, we have with us Prabir Prakash of News Click. Thank you, both of us. Thank you, both of you, for joining us. And to first, uh, Bapa, let's start with the numbers. Quick, could you just take us through what has been announced and declared right now? What is very much in the, uh, what is uncertain, and what are the likely trends that are going to happen? Sure. So, um, to start off with, just before the counting started, people were predicting a blue wave, right? So, so people were talking about a blowout in favor of Biden. We would get it anyway, like people were talking about numbers of 350 to 400 electoral right. votes. All that is out of the window. Now, it's a much more tighter race. And as of now, the, the things which have been announced, and, and not, so there is some confusion because different networks are calling things differently, right? But... Um, as in some networks have announced some states and other networks haven't. So, so 
the consensus announcement till now has uh, Biden leading with 209 electoral votes and Trump with 118 electoral votes. Um, so uh, why things are different from what the opinion polls were saying is that um, uh, there, there are really three interesting regions uh, in the US which, which uh, kind of determine the elections because the, uh, the states like uh, the big states like California, New York, they're, they're already decided they're, they're uh, going to go either uh, completely Democratic or, or Republican. So uh, one of the three regions was uh, the Rust Belt, right? Which was which is the South. Which no, is, no, yeah. the Rust Belt, which is the, which is the uh, the the oh sorry the, 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 the North Northeast, yeah. right? Yeah. And this is where uh, Trump in 2016 broke through what is called the blue wall, right? So so Trump won Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, and that's how he won the elections. Um, this time, those states are actually slow in calling, right? So Pennsylvania is not going to be called today. Uh, because there has been a lot of early voting and Pennsylvania does not count, start counting those uh, votes uh, till much later, right? So, um, and uh, while Michigan, Wisconsin and Minnesota have started counting and they've reached roughly 50%, but there's still a lot of counting to go, right? So, so those states are not calling, um, are not being called right now. Uh, so that adds to the confusion. The other region is the, the South, where... Um, the South has been traditionally been Republican, but in this election, they were saying that Biden has a slim lead right. in three major southern states, which was Florida, Georgia, and uh, North Carolina, right? And uh, Biden is actually underperforming the polls, right? Um, so Trump is doing very well in Florida. So um, while Florida hasn't been called by all networks, some networks have called Florida. So, uh, so, um, uh, about Georgia and North Carolina, there are some absentee ballots which still have to be counted. So, so it's st not as given as Florida is, but I would say 85% chance that um, North Carolina and Georgia will also go with um, Trump. Trump right. Okay. So the other interesting part is the Southwest, which is Arizona, Nevada, that area. Um, it looks like and Nevada numbers are not out. Nevada has only done 1% counting, so, so we don't know anything about Nevada. Uh, Arizona looks like it's uh, uh, advantage for Biden. Biden. So, Biden. so that makes it interesting. Um, uh, if you, uh, if you the, the, the called states, it's Biden 209, Trump 118. But if you, if you make some assumptions, we, make, we give uh, Arizona to Biden, we, we give... Uh, Florida, Texas, Georgia, uh, North Carolina, Ohio, Iowa to Trump. And we make the assumption that the, the, the Rust Belt states, except for Pennsylvania, will go to Trump, right. uh, will go to right. Biden. Oh. In that case, it's, it's, it's very close. It's 263 to 247. Right. Right. So, so one big state, either of the two win. Uh, it, uh, it finishes the game. It finishes the game. The, the, the interesting part is... If Biden wins Nevada, which is the one of the southwestern states where where Biden seems to be doing well, then it becomes a tie, okay, and and then it's possible for Biden to to actually win the election by either winning the one of the two states which do which which split their votes, right? So right. so the two states, uh, Maine and uh, Nebraska, which split their votes, and so if he wins one of those split votes in either of those two states. Uh, then he can just squeak through. Uh, Absolutely. So, right. So just to remind our viewers, again, the way the system works is that each state has a num particular number of electors. These electors come together and elect the president. And in most states, whoever wins that state gets all the electors. So what happens basically is that the decision is, can be determined by a very small number of states, a very uh, for small number of votes as well. Prabir, I want to bring you in here. So... Your quick first thoughts on the results, like Bapa said, there was a strong belief that there was a possibility of even something called a Biden blowout, where he would just sweep through the south, the states in the north, which Bapa was talking about, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. He would maybe even win Florida and Texas, which are traditionally Republican states. And that is definitely not happening today. So how do you see it happening? Well, I think everybody has been at least the pollsters have been again surprised that there is a hidden Trump vote 
Now, how hidden it is, why it is hidden, is something for post-mortem. So I'm not going to deal with it here. But Trump has certainly performed better than what the pollsters expected. The second, uh, I think, important point is also, if you look at the exit polls, the exit poll results are there now, you will see that the constituency which we thought Trump was favored to get uh, support from, that has stood with him. The white male vote, and particularly the post-65 age group, this has held constant for uh, Trump. And though among women voters, younger voters, he performed less well, but the fact that more than 65% of the uh, white male vote has gone to uh, Trump is an indication that there is a deep racial undercurrent to this election, which is what we expected. But that has what has really firmed up the Trump vote in spite of the disaster of the COVID-19 uh, uh, handling that he did. So I think these are some of the quick conclusions we can have. Uh, we are not going to turn sophologists at this juncture when the votes are being counted. And I think it's also the, uh, the vagary of the American system where each state, each county counts its votes. There is no something called election commission, which is what we are familiar in India. And it's a locally elected officials also who deal with a lot of this, who themselves are also partisan. So there's a huge amount of controversies possible. And that's why the final call, if it is very close, as Bapa is saying, based on his current sophology, then if it is very close, it may end up in the courts. So all right. those possibilities exist. But the key issue really is going to be Pennsylvania, as uh, he was talking about. If Pennsylvania goes to Trump, I think we have a huge uh, Biden is unlikely then to find a path to victory. You may still find it, but it's going to be that much more difficult. If Pennsylvania goes to Biden, then I think for Trump, the game is over. So this is really the uh, issue at the moment. What happens to Pennsylvania? And Pennsylvania, the rural areas have been counted. So Trump is quite a bit ahead on that. But since the heavy population centers, which are the urban votes, are going to be counted later, we have to wait or, you know, the finishing of that counting is going to take place later. We have to wait for Pennsylvania to really uh, see which way it's going. So too early to call a much closer election than we thought. Biden still has an edge, but the edge is much slimmer than uh, people had anticipated earlier. So yes, we have to analyze later why Trump has performed better than after all the correction pollsters had made for the predictions. So what really is happening is something that we really, uh, we have to analyze later. But currently still poised, but Biden with a slight edge and difficult for outsiders of the American scene to understand the American elections. But unfortunately, U.S. being the global overlord still, it's an election which is drawing attention from all over the world. Because a lot of countries, uh, there is a stake in the American elections, unfortunately. Right. Absolutely. And one interesting aspect, of course, is that the Electoral College system also has its origins in the early times of the Republic where slavery was very much a factor. And it does privilege certain states, states with actually a lesser population, than the states with more population. So as we have discussed, you can win the popular vote in the US, you can win by millions and still be the loser as far as the electoral college is concerned. So uh, Prabir, yeah, please yeah, go please ahead. Selected Senate composition. The Senate composition also favors exactly those states where the electoral college is also favors. Basically, what you said, the more predominantly white population uh, that rural areas, those are privileged over essentially more populous states with large urban populations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, uh, hey, uh, Probably there is yeah. one interesting thing which is coming up, which is it's true that the white working class has uh, held its support for Trump. Uh, it, it hasn't gone down. Uh, 65 and above is slightly, as of now, um, Trump is underperforming as compared to 2016, very slightly, but the, he is underperforming, which could be because of COVID. But more interestingly, um, Cuban Americans in Florida are what uh, Trump is majorly overperforming from 2016, 
amongst Cuban Americans and amongst uh, Latinos, right? So the Latino numbers could be skewed because the Cuban Americans are, uh, uh, are uh, Trump is hugely or, uh, outperforming his um, results from 2016. That's one. The other is Biden is slightly underperforming uh, amongst blacks uh, from as compared to 2016. So, uh, so, so that's those are two interesting things. And and uh, the Cuban Americans they're saying that's because. Um, um, Trump raised the bogey of socialism, and then the Biden is so they have, will have a socialist program, and that scared the Cuban Americans. But amongst blacks, the underperformance of Biden it could point to the the base not turning out as enthusiastically as it should have. Those those I think still need to be seen after we get the urban centers in. Cuban Americans, of course, we expected in Florida to rally strongly behind Trump. That was a factor which had been already been identified by, by various pollsters. So when you see above 65 performance of Trump of the white uh, demography, as you said, we have to also look at the gender divide over there. I think among white women, Trump has lost uh, some support. And that's because of the abortion issue. Don't forget that for the women, the abortion is much, is much more important than, for instance, among the white men, or men for that matters. And white uh, women have also not been so kind, shall we say, to the packing the Supreme Court and making it anti-abortion majority, in which case there is a real danger of the Roe Wade being overturned. And if that happens, the women are back to the scenario they were in where you had backroom abortions and all of that. So I think there is a strong uh, opinion amongst uh, women about abortion, much more than amongst the men. And that, I think, also shows a little bit up in the above 65 white population that you're talking about. Anyway, I think it's a little, perhaps a little too early to talk about based on the exit polls alone. We are really talking about the exit polls and they are not again representative of the entire voting. But yes, uh, I think the interesting point is that these issues have already been identified. But the extent of the swings, I think that's what has taken at least the pollsters a bit by surprise, because we also get conditioned by what the pollsters are saying, even though we may deflate them a little based on the 2016 elections. But mentally, I was always thinking that, hey, they must have now done enough correction so they won't repeat the 2016 mistakes. But it seems there is something which is different, where the people who they are polling, what they are saying and what they are voting could also be different. So there may be a shamefaced uh, Trump support, which people are not willing to ex accept in public. Maybe that's true. We don't know. Absolutely. Through the, some of the key Senate races as well, because like Prabir mentioned, this is equally an important part of what's happening. So if you could take us to the map and see, uh, show which are the key races. There was some belief, some expectation that the Democrats might actually uh, take over the Senate. They have been, of course, in a minority for which you need 51 seats or 50 seats if the president is going to be a Democrat because the vice president can break the tie. But does it look like it's happening? It, the Senate race is not, it, it, it's, it's going to be, again, very tight, right? So um, before the elections, the current Senate, uh, Republicans have 53 seats and uh, Democrat, the Democrat coalition, right? It's Democrats plus two independents, they have 47 seats. Um, so there was, a, with the blue wave expectation, there was the expectation that the Democrats would win 51 or 52 seats, right? Uh, uh, in which case they have to pick up a net of, four or five seats. Now, one seat, Alabama, um, that was a fluke vi victory last time around. So Alabama has now reverted back to its deep uh, Republican right. uh, base. And so uh, Alabama, Dem the Democrats have lost Alabama, right? A seat which they held. So um, to come to, let's say, 51, they have to now win five seats. Right. Uh, Colorado has already been called for Democrats, right? So, so Hicken Looper, who was, was the governor of Colorado, he 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 has won. Uh, in Arizona, it uh, it hasn't been called, but it looks likely that um, Kelly will uh, the Democrat. Um, uh, he he is going to uh, 
the, 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 the former astronaut, astronaut, I believe. The former Mark astronaut, Kelly, right? right? Um, he, he's he's going to uh, um, win the election. So that makes it forty-seven. So so that so that well that that makes this plus one. Right. So for so that makes it forty-eight. Right. right. Um, now the other ones in in the the next most likely seat was North Carolina, and uh, there Cal Cunningham, the Democrat, was leading in the polls. But about a month before the elections, there was a sexting scandal. He was he was caught. Um, sending sex texts to to somebody, and uh, that appears to be hurting him, right? And and so he is uh, currently behind, um, and um, with not too many votes left to be counted. Um, the other surprising thing is uh, in again because Democrats are underperforming in South in Georgia. There were two elections. One is a special election, which is not going to be decided. Uh, in this round, right? The the, uh, the special election is a is a free for all runner. So there are multiple Republicans and multiple Democrats uh, running there, and uh, uh, the top two go to the the, the runoffs, right? right? So right. the top two have been decided. So there is one Democrat, uh, which is uh, Warnock, and and one Republican, uh, Lof K Kerry Loeffler. Lo uh, uh, Loeffler. So so they are going to be. So, so that's not going to happen now. That's that election is in January. Um, the other race in Georgia. Where the Democrats were projected to pick up, that they are losing. Uh, uh, in Maine, they are project. They were projected to pick up a seat. Uh, Susan Collins, who is a four-time senator, was supposed to lose. Uh, the main counting is like just twenty-five percent, right? So it's too early to say what's going to happen in Maine. Um, in Montana, currently the Democrats are leading, but they are saying that the Republican uh, areas are still to be counted. So again. Montana is not, uh, it, it, we can't call it right now, right? Um, Iowa is very tight. Um, the Republicans are, I think, slightly ahead. So uh, if, if you look at all these seats, these were the seats which were Democrats were supposed to pick up, and they are not picking up. And um, so uh, at that point, they may not even reach 50. Right. So, 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 so uh, if they win the special election, maybe they, they reach 50, but... As of now, um, they, they, they don't seem to be picking up the Senate either. Absolutely. So, Prabir, just uh, uh, building on some of these questions, what we are also, it is true that irrespective of what happens regarding the results, there seems like the American system is definitely headed for more political chaos. We can more or less be certain on that. Because no victory, the victory, victory margins don't seem very close. There's no blood as we predicted. So, even if, suppose, Trump loses, or Trump wins either situation, we are looking at a massive uh, deadlock as far as the American political system is concerned. And one of the key questions we have talked about in NewsClick over the past many years, of course, is what kind of an impact it has, maybe a bit too early to say. But do we see the possibility of an essential continuity still continuing as far as countries like India are concerned, or say uh, in West Asia and China and areas like that? You know, for a long time, we have believed that political instabilities occur only in the global south. That means the global north, the quote-unquote uh, centers of global power, which is the United States, Western Europe, they are stable, quote-unquote, democracies, and they ensure that there's a continuity of the global international globe order, as they say, and the rules of the game. This has been the assumption that has been there for quite some time. And particularly after the uh, end of the Cold War, this is the assumption on which the global system seems to have worked. Before that, there was an accommodation between the globe, uh, West and the Soviet Union, the socialist countries. That decisively swung in one particular direction after the, in the 90s. Now, I think first time we were seeing the fractures which are talked about in other countries as something that happens in unstable global South countries is also enveloping the North. The fractures are deepening and the United States is a classic example where you're talking about deadlocks, you're talking about the uh, kind of certainties breaking down in different ways. You are seeing the Supreme Court becoming the arbiter of a lot of the politics and the Supreme Court itself can be uh, loaded in one particular political direction, which it has been for now. And this is set for now next 20 to 30 years. It is the 60 majority of the right in the Supreme Court. So you see the rules of the game are not holding 
in countries like the United Kingdom, countries like the United States. And the United States, the fractures are deepening. It's very clear. These are stable, deep fractures. Nothing explains why a Trump should be a, such a viable candidate in a country where he has mishandled the epidemic. He has, been, uh, he has taken a hammer to the international trading system. He has not delivered anything that is visible. And yet, he represents a strong political force, as we can see in the elections. And even if Trump loses, the Trumpian politics is going to stay. That's not going away. So I think you have also seen a shift of the Republican Party much more to the right. And that capturing of the Republican Party by the Republican, uh, what would be called the loony right earlier, but that seems to have become the mainstream Republican now. So the fractures are going to deepen. And the American system seems to be enter entering a much more unstable phase. What it has, what its implication for the global system is the credibility of the US as a power is going to go down. So countries like India, which have already run into the anti-China issue, partly because of the northern border clashes, may still stay on the American side. But you can already see in Southeast Asia, countries like Indonesia say, we are not going to be a part of this. This is also happening in some parts of West Asia, not in the monarchies, but in the other, other South, you know, West Asian countries, this is visible. So what you are going to see is a fluidity in international relations in the global order, because a quote unquote stable global order with the United States as the linchpin is no longer going to be there. It's going to be much more openly transactional. America has always been more transactional than any other country. It's going to be much more openly transactional. And that tenor of Trumpian politics, I think, is going to uh, have its shadow, even if Biden wins. I don't think a lot of these things are going to change. So I think we are in for a more unstable United States and a more unstable global order, whichever way the elections go. Right, right. absolutely. And Bapa, one last thing before we close this session, a quick look at the House of Representatives as well. Do we have any numbers regarding what that's going to happen? Of course, that the, the entire House of Representatives was up for election. Uh, there has been one major development, which is one of the proponents of the QAnon conspiracy theories, which Donald Trump has also indirectly supported, has actually won and become a member of the House of Representatives, which really explains what Prabir was talking about in terms of the loony right becoming more and more of a phenomenon. But nonetheless, as far as the numbers are concerned, what do we have? So as of now, the, uh, the called races has uh, 147 uh, uh, Democrats and 151 Republicans. Uh, but a um, lot of the races in California, for example, remain to be called, which, which will lean Democratic. Uh, in New Mexico, Arizona, in, in that entire southwestern belt, those numbers are yet to be called. Right. So uh, they're saying that it's probably going to be similar to the current house, which is a, a, a slight uh, democratic uh, majority. Um, so, um, so, so that, that status quo might remain in, right. in, in the house. Um, th there is the, the it, it sets up, even if, um, if Trump wins, that it sets up for a de deadlock because uh, the house will be democratic. But if Biden wins, and uh, the, the Senate is taken by the Republicans, then, then again it sets up for deadlock. Exactly. Uh, and the deadlock is not, probably talked about the global deadlock, but there is also a, a big dis a debate about the, the size of the stimulus and who the stimulus is directed to. Right. right? And uh, with COVID and continuing lockdowns, uh, there is a serious uh, risk of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of a deepening of the recession. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and with this kind of deadlock, you, 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 you would... Um, get into problems even economically. Absolutely, right. And one interesting thing, of course, is that uh, Trump has, of course, like Prabir mentioned, packed the Supreme Court with six judges who are, uh, six judges are now Republicans or, or conservatives for that matter. Trump himself has appointed three. But one overlooked aspect of the Trump administration is that he's also packed the lower courts, which means that a huge number of judges, very conservative, very young, have been appointed who are going to stay long. So just like in some senses, the RSS is filling up administrative institutions in uh, India. We have an entire ideological body there, which is actually doing the same. So, in fact, when the deadlock happens, a lot of these cases will go to court 
and it's very likely that they rule in favor of the conservatives. So, so one of the uh, hopes, at least for the progressives, were that there were talk of uh, Biden uh, one packing the courts, right? So increasing it from the current nine to 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 to, to various numbers, to it was various 13, numbers, even eighteen. Yeah, so the progressives would would have right. there were more progressives. The other was to get rid of the filibuster, which is right. a peculiar American thing where you need a super majority to pass anything. Right. But with these kinds of numbers. They are not going to be able to do either of those two things. So, exactly. so then we are going to get into this. Into a phase of major deadlock. Yeah. Right, absolutely. And Prabir, I just wanted to return one last bit uh, to something we talked about earlier that was regarding the uh, Latinx vote. And as you said, it's maybe too early to predict. But one thing definitely that may have helped Trump is the fact that the kind of policies he's unleashed against Cuba, the kind of policies he's unleashed against Venezuela, Bolivia, of course, is maybe likely to have definitely helped with that vote? Well, it depends on where the people have come from. Latinx vote, you may talk about as if it's a homogeneous politics. It is not. Right. Depending on where the refugees have come from, they are likely to vote one way or the other. So obviously from Cuba, the refugees who have come, the expats who have come into the United States have been people who are deeply anti-left. To some extent, it's true for Venezuela as well. So those are the kind of things that that go into uh, which way they vote in America, if United States. If you are coming from a right wing dictatorship and you are fleeing the dictatorship, you are likely to vote left. But if you are uh, abandoning a country because the left has won there, then of course your politics could be quite different. So it's not again a homogeneous uh, issue. Absolutely. But more than that, you know, when I, they come into the United States, some of them also change their demography in the sense that if you are, what, how do you identify yourself? Do you identify yourself as white or as brown and black? That is one issue. How conservative you are in your social values. So the question of uh, abortion, for instance, for a lot of the Catholic uh, devout population becomes an issue. So there are a large number of other issues by which we, unlike the white-black divide, which is much sharper, the, the Latinx divide is actually more difficult to call because of all of this. I don't think they're as homogeneous politically or socially as we would think of the other two. So you can think of bigger constructions of race over there, but I think the Latinx population really falls somewhere in between. And therefore, uh, there is more, uh, sh uh, more determinants of which way a group will behave or not. And finally, it's uh, the people who vote. It's not that you vote only according to your identities. So I don't think we should lose sight of that. But Absolutely. what we are talking about is the dominant vote amongst the white men uh, and the dominant vote amongst the uh, African-American population. Uh, that is very clear. If you take the Indian population, for instance, the fact that Modi might have a much larger support than uh, Trump has had in these elections. Earlier, the Democrats probably used to win about 90, 85 to 90% of the Indian vote. Uh, now they're winning only about 75% of the Indian vote, mainly because in the US, they don't identify themselves with Trump as much as they identify themselves with Modi. So these are the shifts that take place. Yes, the Latinx vote is more uh, probably uh, dem dem democratic uh, inclined, but to what extent it is, is really the question. And that had taken some of the pollsters a little bit of surpri by surprise. So the Latin vote seemed to be the one which was more uh, with tr there were sections of the Latin vote more with Trump than they expected. And Florida, of course, shows in the results itself that right. there has, that has not only held, but it has actually overperformed than the expectations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabir and Bapa, for this first session. So we're going to be coming back soon with uh, some more guests, some more discussions on the races that are happening right now. And uh, as we head into this break, we bring you an interview which we did recently with Ben Becker. Ben is the editor-in-chief of Breakthrough News, a US-based independent media outlet which covers a variety of issues related to the working people, 
which is related to issues of race, issues of poverty, issues of unemployment. And in this small interview, he talks about what impact these kind of issues were having on the elections. It's a tale of two Americas that we're seeing unfold before us. Uh, the stock market in a few months ago hit a new record high and the uh, billionaires are, are, have brought in an additional six, over $650 billion since the start of the pandemic. So while it's true that the people are suffering, not all people are suffering. Uh, and in fact, it's been a big boon for the, those who own the majority of the, the corporate stocks uh, in the country. And on the other side, it's the exact opposite. We're seeing uh, people waiting in long lines for food. Uh, the poverty rate, as you said, has gone way up. The unemployment rate is officially gone down to 7.9%, but the unemployment rate is extremely deceptive. It doesn't count those who have stopped looking for work altogether. And if you have a, a, a very low paying part-time job, even if you're looking for a full-time job, you're not considered unemployed. So the real number of unemployed, uh, some estimate to be around 31 million, uh, perhaps even up to 35 million. Just in August and September alone, for instance, 1.1 million workers, quote, dropped out of the workforce, which really means that they've given up. They've, they've, uh, they have a life of such despair that they won't even be able to look for work and are just trying to survive through other means. They're not going to be counted as unemployed. By contrast, they said the economy added 600,000 jobs. So in other words, more workers dropped out of the workforce altogether than the number of jobs that were added. And notably, 80% uh, of those who dropped out of the workforce altogether were women. And that's, a, that's an aspect of this uh, jobs crisis that is, is somewhat new. In the 2008 financial crisis, it was uh, women who basically powered the recovery, women workers. In this one, it's 80, 80 to 5% are, are actually dropping out of the workforce altogether because they're dealing with the additional burdens, of course, of, of um, household labor and other things that are just making it impossible. And because women are concentrated in the economic sectors, whether it's the government or service work uh, that have been deeply impacted by the, by the crisis. So, um, and of course, if you don't have a job, you don't have money, and under capitalism, you need money for everything, especially in the United States. You need it for health care. You need it um, to pay your bills. You need to pay off your debts. You need it for food. So really, an economic crisis or a jobs crisis is a, is a full-scale social crisis for tens of millions of workers. I mean, you're talking about two arch-capitalist candidates. So for them, they wouldn't even accept that there is a capitalist crisis or that, that there's something to be saved from. They, for them, this is sort of the way the economy has always worked. It's perhaps accelerated its basic uh, inequality and in features during this period. So, I mean, to be honest, there is a difference. We couldn't say that there's no difference. Donald Trump basically has a program of a death march, just march everybody back to work. And that's the, that's really the proposal of large sectors of the capitalist class too. get everyone back to work. Uh, people who have uh, underlying conditions, comorbidities, um, older people are more likely to perish. Young people won't die. It's basically a price worth paying for them uh, in order to get the economy going again. They're even entertaining ridiculous, unscientific ideas like, like herd immunity um, privately. They won't quite say it publicly, but really the Trump, uh, the Trump team is, is very seriously toying with these types of ideas. Um, and you, you see it in terms of how they, they relate to the question of masks and other things that they really think that we should just rush the country uh, back to work and whoever dies, dies. The Biden camp does have a different proposal. Um, and for instance, it's, it's to have lots of stimulus, uh, government payments, especially to state and local governments, which would, which would make a big difference in terms of alleviating some of the situation. But um, they haven't really taken on the, the core aspects of the policy, which would be necessary to really uh, stop the suffering. And that would be, for instance, to cancel rents, and other uh, payments for basic utilities, uh, cancel the, the debt payments, uh, to, to give full paycheck protection. The government has so much money when it comes to the military, when it comes to bailouts. I mean, they just opened up the spigots and let all the money flow to the biggest banks within you know, two weeks of the pandemic. There's nothing like that for, for the working class. There's been one $1,200 check uh, there's been very little to small businesses. Half a million small businesses have gone under during the pandemic. Um, a lot of them are barely hanging on, and are and if they don't do well, 
during this sort of holiday season. They're going to lay off lots more workers. Um, so those sort of the, the scale of the problem is not being met by either candidate. Uh, I think to meet the scale of the problem, you'd have to infringe on the rights of capital. You'd have to infringe on the rights of property. You'd have to tell the landlords you cannot uh, expel anyone from their houses. You cannot evict them. You'd have to tell employers that uh, you know you can't lay people off. But if you don't, and you'd have to tell insurance companies you have to cover people. I mean, I, I think it's probably astonishing to people around the world, but in the United States, um, millions and millions of people have lost their health care coverage during the pandemic, and one million healthcare workers have been laid off during the pandemic. So, you know, this is the anarchy of our, of our economic system, which is on full display. And while some stimulus checks, which is what Biden um, and the Democrats are proposing, would be very much, you know, welcome by millions of people, they, they would really just be a temporary solve and, and wouldn't solve the problem. Welcome back to News Click and People's Dispatch, and we have with us uh, Bapa at the studio and Vijay Prashad is soon going to join us. But before we go into that, we're going to be taking a look at the map again at the latest results of the U.S. presidential elections because that is really what the con contest is really about right now, where all the uncertainty is. So we're going to be taking a look at the map once again and just see where exactly uh, the uncertainty is, where exa what exactly the toss-up states are right now, so to speak. So Baba, could you just sort of take us through what exactly these numbers mean because there's a wide variety of colors and a wide variety of numbers on the map. So if you could just quickly take us through these numbers again and what looks like happening right now. Sure. Um, so I think we should start off with, uh, with a caveat that the headline, we shouldn't be looking at the headline numbers, right? So the numbers in dark blue and dark red are what have been called by the networks, right? And so based on what has been called by the networks, Biden is at 213 and Trump is at 174. Right um, now, uh, on top of that, there are states which we are adding to Biden and Trump, um, which which where which haven't been called by the networks, but uh, which appear to be going that way. Right. So Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, these are the southern states. They most likely will end up with Trump. And those are in the south. There we see Texas with 38. Yeah. Uh, Georgia with 16, and North Carolina with 15. Those are all in. They're uh, light red to pink. Yes, and, 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 and also um, um, Alaska. Right. Um, so... Uh, and that adds to 73 then. Yes. Right. Um, and uh, so, so if you add those things, um, it comes to... Well, and, and we, we have added one of the, um, one of the seats in, in Nebraska. Nebraska. Right, so, right. so there are two states, Nebraska and Maine, where, uh, they, where they don't give all their electoral votes to the, to the person who wins the majority. They split their votes, so Nebraska one seat most likely will go to um, uh, Trump. That make that takes the number to 247. And uh, for Biden, Arizona has been called by Fox News, right? So 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 we're giving Arizona to. Uh, uh, that's on the west with the eleven. That's yeah. eleven electoral the, college the, votes. The southwest, light blue, uh, yes. yeah, right. Southwest. Um, now on top of Arizona, Maine, uh, which is on the northwest corner. Um, Maine again splits his votes, so so we have given uh, three of those uh, things to uh, Biden. Right. The, the the one uh, the second district of Maine is still to be called, um, and then assuming the that Minnesota where uh, uh, Biden is leading uh, with with um, about seventy five plus percent of the vote counted, Biden is leading in Wisconsin and. Minnesota, which we are showing as blue, currently Trump is leading there, right? You mean Wisconsin and Michigan? Sorry, Wisconsin and Michigan. On top, yes. Yeah, on, the, so, on the northeast. So there, not north, right. Wisconsin has counted about 75% of its votes. And uh, Trump is currently uh, leading. However, uh, the, the greater Milwaukee area, which is the metropolitan area, there the votes still haven't been counted, or, or majority of the votes haven't been counted. So that's why there is expectation that... Um, Wisconsin will eventually go with Biden, and uh, Michigan, about with 50% of the votes, uh, Trump is leading. But again, the the greater Detroit area, a uh, lot of the counting hasn't happened there. So, so assuming that those fall to Biden in large numbers, uh, we we will give the sta states to Biden. At that point, it is very close for either candidate, 
right, 263 to 247. Uh, then it really depends on these two states, right? Uh, Pennsylvania is a big state. If Biden wins Pennsylvania, Biden wins. Uh, Pennsylvania is most likely not going to be called, not just today, but may not be called for many days. Right. Okay. Uh, so if Pennsylvania is not called, then Biden's road to uh, victory is by winning Nevada, uh, which, which is very early stages of counting today, which is in the Southwest, and then winning one of the two split votes in Maine, or Nebraska. or Nebraska. Right. So it's going to be razor. If Pennsylvania goes to Trump, then Biden basically has, it's, it becomes a total toy cost at that point. Right. Absolutely. Right. So what we're seeing right now is that it is a very, very tight race. Very difficult to say who's going to win. And we have with us Vijay Prashad, uh, Director of the Tri-Content Institute of Social Research. Vijay, thank you so much for joining us. Please, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I was a little delayed because my computer got so scared when I opened CNN.com, <laughs> it crashed. And so I had to restart everything and I had to pacify it and tell my computer. My computer, I should tell you, Prashant is uh, Apple, so it's a liberal. And so it was terrified to find that, in fact, there might be a genuine Nazi going to... I have to forgive my computer if I had... <laughs> done things differently i might have bought a republican computer but you know that's where i am so so Absolutely. so there it is <laughs> right right <laughs> Vijay, Vijay, so, so, i mean, I mean uh, uh, to, uh, uh, at, uh, at the uh, risk uh, of sounding a bit naive or maybe asking a bit of a naive question and i ask you this also because uh, you were one of the authors behind the book strongman which came out a few years ago and that really sort of looked into trump modi erdogan uh, all these uh, all these people who exert a particular kind of political and ideological sway. But we also went into this election with the coronavirus. We went into a horrible recession. There was unemployment uh, soaring. And, uh, you know, your general expectation is that at a point like this, a lot of the right, uh, say, Trump's promises start to crumble. His, he gets exposed. That's your general understanding often. And I think maybe even a lot of polling sort of try to point that out in the sense of saying coronavirus, uh, people are unhappy with his performance. But what we see right now is actually a very, very close contest. So how do you sort of analyze this? Um, see, look, Prashant, there's uh, maybe two different ways to go about this. One is there's a long view, a long historical view, and the other is a much more conjunctural, immediate view. The long view is the United States, since its origin, has an unfinished fight which is the fight around racism. I mean, you know, it fought a civil war between 1861 and 1865. And in 1865, there was not a result. You know, the Confederacy, the let's call them for just simplicity, the pro-slavery, uh, uh, you know, branch of the civil war uh, was not defeated. You know, they lost the battles, but they were not defeated. I mean, you know, they, they continued to uh, flourish. In fact, these statues that have come down in recent years of Confederate generals, these statues were put up after the war ended. I mean, can you give me an example of a war where the defeated party put up statues of their generals all across their territory? You know, let's imagine in Germany, there'd be statues of all the Nazi generals and of Himmler and, and you know, uh, and Hitler himself and so on. No, but well, in the US South, it's littered with you know, Confederate uh, signs. So there was no defeat. And that Confederacy incubates a deep white supremacist attitude right through the United States, which is why if you look at the map, there is this enormous red space that runs from, you know, the northern, the border with Canada, all the way down a swath across the American South, including, you know, the panhandle region of, of, of Florida, where the Republicans just win almost every, every vote. And that has been the case regardless of it's not about Trump. It's not even about George W. Bush. It's a long-standing 
slavery day republican hold which before used to be held by the slavery supporting democratic party right. you know it just it's just that the name of the party switched that's one explanation there is this unfinished civil war that continues you know n- now it's called the culture war but i think that's a misnomer it's the old civil war that's just it was in half time in 1865 and then it just keeps picking up and keeps going into half time and keeps right. picking up the immediate conjunctural thing is that the democratic party and by the way biden might end up winning but by a whisker you know he may win by a whisker that's the scandal i mean you know here you have a situation with trump people thought how could hillary clinton not have walked all over him but she was defeated by him she won the popular vote biden will most likely win the popular vote but they lose the presidency most likely biden as well and this is you know enormous the enormous problem of the fact that liberal political parties have no program no mass program to go in front of the people with they can't carry anything they refuse to talk about universal health care they refuse to talk about even the most basic decent policies of you know in the middle of a pandemic let's you know refund public health care uh, let's provide people with just Well, let's forget our debates about universal basic income let's provide a universal basic income they just refuse to come out with these broad sweeping decent policies they try to triangulate to the right and and look at trump he has gained in demographics you can't imagine black men latino men you know how has he made gains there because this guy he is nuts he comes out and says whatever the hell he wants that conviction actually carries more weight i i feel than the content of his policies he he comes with conviction it's the same with erdogan you know he comes with a certain conviction erdogan like trump appeals to the pious nationalism which pretends to be submerged it's not submerged modi the same you know hindus hindus should be proud to be hindus this pious kind of patriotism and nationalism which again pretends to be submerged they share all of them share this they all speak to you know people saying it's okay to be arrogant you know it's just fine to be a nazi even it's okay and they then motivate people i mean we've got to draw a lesson at some point the democrats say no no you need a safe candidate like biden rather than ba- bernie not a safe candidate well the safety means basically the gag order safety means you can't speak your mind absolutely and vijay in this context i, I a lot, lot of, lot of uh, thought already i mean irrespective of like you said what the result is a lot of thought probably already going into what kind of happens after this and one inspiring sign of so course, the past, past few months was the sheer extent, extent of uh, protest that took, that took place, place following, following the murder of george floyd, floyd of course but also, also around, the around the pandemic itself, itself. there were there protests, protests around, around against eviction there were protests around rent, rent. there were protests, there were protests around, around poverty a lot of community, community mob- mobilizing as well and like you said i think this election probably even more conclusively demonstrates the limitations of the safe candidate argument because even biden was even a more safer candidate than hillary the point was people liked him a lot of polls saying that you know the likability factor was much more with biden and still we are at a place where he's so close to losing so in this context uh, how do you see for instance in the coming years the kind of organizing and mobilizing that needs to take place there is talk of uh, third parties of course but also in terms of the social movements how do you see it taking place Well, firstly, the protest movements that took place took place in states that largely vote Democratic. You know, it's it's New York State, it's California, and you know these these protest movements have produced results. The the you know minimum wage is raised in many states already. You know, Florida had whoever wins Florida, there's a progressive bent in demo in the local politics. You know, they've been able to move an agenda. I have to say, many states voted for legalizing not only marijuana but also psych. get like mushrooms and 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 so on so not not to say there's a correlation between let's say protests for higher wages and psychedelic mushrooms but these are states which anyway are liberal and are refreshingly open and and have a socialist bent i mean alexandra ocasio cortez reelected ayana presley reelected ilan omar reelected you know i mean these women are back and 
they're going to be there. New York State Legislature, four members of the Democratic Socialist uh, Organization elected. One of them, by the way, Mira Nair's son. Um, you know, uh, the filmmaker Mira Nair's son will go to Albany to be in the New York Assembly. Um, so, you know, it's not like these protest movements don't have it, but these protest movements are not happening in the so-called red states or in, in some of these battleground states, but certainly not in the red states. I mean, when when does when does Texas actually change its colors? I mean, you know, they keep thinking, and, and I must say that that fellow Beto Rock, after his presidential run, and you know, one wondered why did he run for president? But in the last couple of months, he's been going to every single constituency in Texas and been motivating and mobilizing people to vote. And apparently it is having an impact. So these are long term projects. It's, it's actually the case that you need more trade unions need to be much more active in like a state like Ohio, you know, Ohio used to, until the 1980s, have a, a congressman who was very, very progressive. You know, he was out there as an anti-war person and so on. Why? Because that was a time when Ohio had uh, major manufacturing. It had, therefore, trade union activity. And then it, it was able to have, you know, political figures who rep represented workers in a very real way. I don't mean, I mean, I don't think we should underestimate those histories. But as you deindustrialize the, these parts of the country, unions lo lost their focus. Unions began to chase the Democrats and they all lost their way. I mean, you've got to rebuild from movement up. You can't just go and win elections. You know, if you don't have strong movements, if you don't build the reservoirs of something different, you can't win elections. Elections are won based on, you know, culture and movement. Uh, these are the two things. Uh, culture is against the left in general because culture is dominated deeply by, you know, wretched things we inherit, but also the media and, you know, that's colonized by the right. That's culture, but movement is our domain. And unless we're out there building movements, building capacity, putting leaders up from movements, not bringing in leaders from outside and saying vote for them, you know. So this is the kind of thing that's a long term game. I, I don't want to denigrate the movements for higher wages and, you know, Black Lives Matter, because I think they have an impact. It's just that. Unfortunately, they take place in Massachusetts and in California, which are guaranteed states to vote for the Democrats. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much, Vijay, for talking to us. We'll be talking to you in the coming days as well as things become clearer and the chaos either gets settled or it gets worse, <laughs> both of which might happen. <laughs> I think all of it is good. All of it will happen. OK, take care of Absolutely. yourselves. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Right. That was Vijay Prashad. And we are going to move into our next segment soon, where we'll be joined by Eugene Pudier of Breakthrough News. Eugene has been doing a live on the elections. It's been quite, uh, to say the least, both exciting and confusing and chaotic, a mix of emotions. So before we are joined by Eugene, here's a short interview with him, which he gave a couple of days before the elections, where he talked about some of the key scenarios and possibilities. You know, with the mail-in ballots, the biggest question that is facing the country, and I know for many people worldwide, this may seem uh, amazing, but in America, there are no universal rules about voting. Every state makes individual rules. So one of the biggest issues for mail-in ballots, of course, is what happens if a ballot is postmarked by election day, but because the mail isn't working right or whatever it may be, your ballot doesn't get there until after election day. Now, some states just say, oh, forget it, too late. That's on you, but many states allow there for to be a small period. Some say three days, some say nine days, but something that where as long as the postmark on it that says you put this in by elect on election day or before election day, it can still be counted. So the Republican Party in particular has been aggressively challenging this, potentially, you know, because they know the vast majority of Democrats will be voting via mail this year. So there have been a range of different issues that have happened and there have been different rulings. So in Pennsylvania, which is going to be one of the key states here, the Supreme Court has ruled that they are allowed to accept the ballots as they planned up to three days after, but that they could revisit that decision after the election. Right. So right now in Pennsylvania, if it comes in three up to three days after, your vote can be counted, but that could actually change. So we could have three or four different shifts. North Carolina, 
also another big state. Uh, you know, Biden seems to be relatively well ahead in Pennsylvania. North Carolina, which is a key state, absolute dead heat here. And this could be the key state of the whole country, honestly, is North Carolina. But uh, one of the main ones, they have a nine day window. The Supreme Court has allowed the nine day window, but they've also said we could revisit that. Wisconsin, another major state. Now, in that case, the Supreme Court has decided they can't count any ballots after the election. So that is just out of the, out of the blue. And then last night, in a, in a, or last late afternoon, in a, a sort of, I don't know if it was unexpected decision, but a major decision, Minnesota, which is usually Democratic, but has been trending a little bit more towards Republicans as of late. Uh, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that they cannot have a nine day window, which means that everyone who voted yesterday and maybe many people who didn't see the story in the news and voted today, their ballots are now invalid. So we've got Minnesota, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, uh, all states where are that are, you know, not maybe not all traditional battlegrounds, but that are all sort of battleground states this year where there's been heavy campaigning that could be the major states where this comes out. Those states are all at a position where we don't even know what's going to happen because the rules could change. But in most of those states, it's very close. And so, you know, a 10,000 ballots here, 5,000 ballots here, 100,000 ballots there could make the election. And we could have three or four flip flops uh, in the week after the election. So who knows? Now, voter suppression, which is also a huge issue. Um, is going to come into play in a couple other states that are also critical. For instance, Georgia. Georgia is a state that is almost never a swing state. Uh, for years, it was solidly Democratic during the Jim Crow era, and now it has been solidly Republican for, you know, really about three or four decades. But there has been a tremendous voter mobilization in Georgia. In the Senate race there, one of the Senate races, the Democrat is, is up in a way that seems pretty significant. And another one, it's very, very close. And so there's a lot of conversation. State of Georgia tried to purge 300,000 voters from the rolls, including, get this, a 92-year-old woman who had voted for the same place for 50 years in a row. And they tried to tell her that she couldn't vote. So there's a lot of efforts going on to sort of fight back against this, to get people to re-register. This has been happening for months, um, to challenge some of these things. But it's unclear if those 300,000 people how many ultimately will not be allowed to vote or will have to cast something called a provisional ballot, which means you're not, they, they can't certify you're the person, but they let you fill something out. Many of those aren't counted. Now, Wisconsin, which I previously mentioned, and this is why the issue of the ballots is crucial, Wisconsin is a major voter suppression state. There have been tens of thousands of people purged this year. It's actually, there's still some litigation going on around this, so it's not clear. But to give you a sense of how wild voter suppression is, basically what happens is they send you a card in the mail to say, are you a voter are you not and you know they're designed to look like junk mail and all these other things so that people won't either will miss it or just won't respond to it or whatever and then they say that you're no longer there a study was done by investigative reporter greg palace where they looked at thousands and thousands of these votes about did people really move uh, spoiler alert, the vast majority of them did not move at all. And that's the essence of voter uh, uh, suppression is they say, well, we're just trying to keep the voting rolls clean. But uh, they do everything possible in many of these states with voter suppression to get you to not return the ballots. And, and so it's this interesting dichotomy. But in states like Wisconsin and Georgia, I think this could end up being one of the biggest issues because Democrats are, are at a knife's edge. But these, like, if the Democrats win Georgia, Trump loses the election. So they're going to have a huge amount of, of energy on the Republican side to try to block this. And they've already been doing it beforehand. I'm sure they'll do it afterwards. And I think that that's more or less where we stand right now. Um, and we, But more states could come into play, Arizona, Texas, um, where there have also been similar issues, especially Texas, with massive voter suppression, closing down of polling places, making it difficult to vote early, all these different issues. So, it, you know, in the primary, we saw this in Texas in one place exactly. in Houston where people had to wait for six and a half hours to vote. And this is a Democratic primary in a Democratic city um, where they're trying for to help people vote. So it gives you a sense of the state of affairs. Hello and welcome back to News Click and People's Dispatch. We are discussing the U.S. elections, especially the presidential race, where there is a lot of uncertainty still, things very much unclear. This was expected, but not really to this extent. The race being this close was not as expected. And according to the New York Times, Around 223 electoral vo college votes have been decided for Joseph Biden, 174 for Donald Trump, and 141 are still uh, uncertain. They're undecided as of now. And this could take a couple of days even to get resolved because counting in Pennsylvania, which is probably one of the most important states right now, is probably going to take some time. 
so uh, we need to the, the each candidate needs to 70 to win so both candidates have a fairly good chance depending on how things turn out and now we're joined by eugene purier of breakthrough news eugene thank you so much for joining us oh, i'm so happy to be here thank you for having me right right so, so you, you were in the, break the breakthrough news studio you were doing a live a couple of hours ago coverage of the elections of course uh what's uh, what's in your mind right now as in was this what you were anticipating or is it something very different from what you thought might happen you know i i think that it's not very different from what i thought might happen but it is a little different from what i uh bet a couple of people so i'm in i'm in trouble here <laughs> but uh i mean i think we're sort of at a coin flip election and i think even though the polls were trending towards biden many of the states were so close and as as i'm sure many of people who are watching this know you know there's a sampling error in polling there's 3 or 4% it could kind of go either way so there were a number of states that it was clear could go either way and i think that's basically what we're seeing here now i would say my biggest takeaways so far is, is twofold you know one we're seeing a bit of a change in the electoral map arizona which has been great for republicans in the past decade looking good for democrats georgia which has been great for republicans in the last decade also looking good for democrats but you look at states like wisconsin which for years good for democrats was run by trump looking good for uh, president trump uh, pennsylvania north carolina where democrats have been very uh, very uh, effective you know a, a lot of different things that are happening that you have gone against the trends of maybe the past 20 or 30 years and i think that there's a lot to that but i think it's interesting to note that we're seeing at least some slight shifts in sort of the traditional electoral map in the united states i would say the second thing that is really sitting with me is the reflection about how people's consciousness really isn't linear. I mean, you look at Florida which has been called for President Trump and pretty handily for President Trump, but over 60% of voters in Florida voted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. So out polling a Democrat who is running on a minimum wage of $15 an hour. So obviously many Republicans and others voting for third parties uh were were embracing that and I think you can look around the country and see somewhat similar things. I mean, the war on drugs here in the United States was the driver of mass incarceration which imprisoned so many millions of black working class people um big rebuke around the country from decriminalization of of most drugs in Oregon to legalization of marijuana in a number of places and these are really votes that are directly linked to the criticism of the war on drugs being racist that has really been the tipping point over the past few cycles so we're seeing that even though the race is is maybe a coin flip at this point even though Donald Trump has a very good chance to win that there are quite a number of indications that there are many people even some who are who, you know nominally consider themselves conservatives who are willing to back uh, you know a pro working class agenda and at least to some degree to back policies that are really bucking the trends of the conservative uh, past 30 or 40 years we've seen in the country absolutely and you didn't you didn't in this context uh, i wanted to also raise maybe a development that's happening kind of counter to this which is that there is also a strengthening of the right which is unprecedented we have of course the a q and on an open supporter of the qanon movement who has been elected to congress are the extremist congressman as well so we do see that the right is also kind of bringing in a new generation of young uh, activists young for lack of a better word activists who are really pushing uh, extreme right wing agenda across the country so how do you see this development as well I think that's an extraordinarily important point. I think it's serious. I mean, Marjorie Cohn, I believe it was in Georgia, uh who's all who supports QAnon and is a major uh you know, very very against Muslims, very very heated rhetoric against Muslims. Uh Madison Cawthorn, uh who I believe is in North Carolina, who took some sort of trip to Hitler's vacation home and posted about it on his Facebook. I mean, even in candidates who are going to lose like Laura Loomer, who's a sort of a far right kind of prank artist is maybe the best way to describe her also deeply Islamophobic. public just the fact that she could become a candidate is, is notable Matt Gates who of course ran run his race i think you're very right i think the way you described it is true i think the impact of the trump administration has been to drive out many center right forces inside of the republican party or at least make them feel very uncomfortable within the republican party and to really sort of reboot with new people who are more in tune with the trump base that i don't think it, it's too far off what republicans had been saying for some time really since the nixon administration where they switched to something that in America was called the southern strategy really using racism as a major wedge issue as democrats uh started to embrace civil rights but i think we have seen that 
Trump has really brought so much more of the, the sort of ethnic grievance politics into the open. And his argument is, is very clear that the, the hollowing out of many rural and working class places, especially in the Midwest, by deindustrialization, that that can be directly linked to a rise in rights for, for undocumented immigrants, for black people, for women. And obviously, there's not a connection there, but there's sort of an Occam's razor. They say, well, remember when things were good? Well, seemed like black people knew their place, that women knew their place, that there weren't all these immigrants coming into the country. And so there's no real connection, but there's sort of a cultural feeling that the changes in, in some of the demographics in America have gone along with the economic decline. And it's created this, this very toxic mix of of what is sort of, it, it, it speaks in many ways to the lower middle class and to the working class that have been deeply harmed by capitalism in America, especially neoliberalism and deindustrialization. But on the same token, it's not a straight up class appeal. It's sort of like an ethnic chauvinist appeal linked up with some of the, the broader elements and the broader changes we've seen. And I think we're seeing more politicians. And that, ironically enough, even if Joe Biden is to win, I, I think the trend you have outlined will continue and could perhaps grow stronger. I think we're seeing it really around the country in Republican primaries that the more right wing candidates, the more extreme candidates, the more semi fascist candidates are winning because they're willing to tap into the Trump base and, and to abandon a lot of the orthodoxy of the center right Republican Party, particularly on foreign policy and particularly on quote unquote deficit issues, i.e. retirement insurance um, and, and, and um, uh, government funded health insurance for older people, Social Security and Medicare. So they're jettisoning some of that neoliberalism um, while bringing in sort of an extra dose of ethnic nationalism tied up with sort of a, a convoluted semi, I, I wouldn't even call it a class appeal, maybe semi pseudo class appeal. And I think that will continue and it'll grow stronger. And we're seeing it, uh, we're really seeing it in pretty much every state. I mean, it's notable um, in some of the ones you, you listed, but I think we've seen it, um, you know, even in New York state where I am, which is a very liberal state, you've seen the Republicans, it's like a big time Trump supporter heads up the Republicans in Manhattan. You know, the Wall Street Republicans are even embracing these people. So we're seeing it happen in a big way. Absolutely. And in, in connection to that, to one, that last one last question. Uh, last time after the elections, we did see that there was a lot of talk about how the white working class was what had given Trump the election, which was, which was of course, a problematic narrative in its own way. And I'm sure that after, in the, after this election too, we are going to be seeing a lot of those kind of discussions as well. But I just wanted to ask you maybe something to slightly counter that in terms of, has there been a trend of also mobilizing some of these sections against the right wing? You kind of diagnosed the problem very well. But in terms of people's movements, in terms of organizations that are there in the country, has there been kind of a pushback against that kind of agenda that's happening? Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that's most notable is uh, all white people of all class strata and all political parties over the past three or four years, uh, more and more people have, have embraced really a lot of the criticism of the police, racism and policing, mass incarceration. Oh, even over 50 percent of Republicans earlier this summer were saying they wanted to see some changes. I, I think that it's also very important to think about class strata. When you look at the white working class in America, people who make uh, you know, this for America is a very low amount of money under about thirty thousand dollars a year in America. White working class people almost always vote for the Democrats, um, regardless of who they are. So the poorest people know what's going on. It's really kind of the middle strata of the working class who've been the most aggressively affected by factory uh, job, factories closing and the changes in the workforce and so on and so forth. But I think there has been some effect. I think it's like when you see things like the $15 an hour minimum wage in Florida, that's a sign of that, that a, a union led campaign that's running a straight up appeal that is going to improve people's lives can reach a lot of people who maybe are, you know, uh, workers in a factory on the, in Amazon or in the Space Coast in Florida who love Trump for whatever reason, but sort of recognize what's going on. I think the real challenge is, is how to start to bring these things in a coherent whole that it can start to reach millions and millions of these people. But I think if you look at Erie, Pennsylvania, that, that's an area, the very white working class area. Uh, Biden seems to be doing actually OK there. That's going to be an important county for Trump. So I, I think that we have seen some movement on this. I think that we have seen uh, some victories in some ways, but it hasn't really found a full political expression. It's here, there and everywhere. And quite frankly, Trump 
His appeal is more potent because the Democrats are unwilling to put into the field a strong class program. So they'll sort of speak to and genuflect in the direction of many of these people's concerns, but they won't just come straight out and start arguing for universal health care and, uh, you know, $15 an hour tomorrow. All these different elements that could pro- that might sway people because it would speak to their immediate interests. And it seems like Trump is speaking more to their immediate interests because he'll say immigrants are the problem and I'm going to do something tomorrow. While, you know, Democrats will say, well, no, it's not immigrants, it's income inequality. I'll do something six years from now. Uh, right. and, and it's a difficult piece. So I think that will be the big challenge for pushing back on this is whether independent political movements can start to find more of a coherent voice and present this kind of, of progressive front to people in a way that they can digest and understand. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so Thank much, you so Eugene, for talking. This live and as we kind of predicted in the morning, it still is completely uncertain. There is no clarity on what's going to happen in the coming days. So, Baba Gedi, maybe before we wind up, take us uh, take us to what's happening with the numbers right now. Yeah. So, um, if you look at the maps, the states which have been called by the major networks, uh, Biden uh, on that basis, Biden has two twenty three electoral votes and Trump has one seventy four. Um, if you then add um, some states which are likely to go uh, to, to Biden and Trump, uh, we come to 237 versus 231, right? So, so some things have changed uh, since, since we last focused on the maps. Minnesota has been called. That's for, on the center north, the MN with 10 yeah, votes. Yeah, yes, so right. that has been called for Biden. Uh, Georgia, which was, we were leaning towards giving it to Trump now has been pulled back because the, the late numbers are makes it a coin flip, right? So, so you can't really call it either way. Uh, Michigan is interesting, right? Because Michigan, more than 50% of the votes have been counted and Trump is leading by 10 percentage points. Okay. Right. So whether the Do- Detroit area will be able to overcome a 10 percent point lead. And you know, Michigan is interesting because Biden was polling quite uh, had a huge advantage in the pre-election close polls. To, uh, Mich- both Mich- Michigan and Wisconsin, Biden had a close to 10% or, or let's say between 8 to 10% lead. So uh, if he doesn't do Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, because those three states, the three states, working class population, the white working class, the the the, the, their states which are getting de-industrialized are similar problems. So uh, those are now key. If, if Biden doesn't win those states, uh, it is not going to be, it, it's, it's really, let's say, uh, I, I mean, the, the states other than those states is, let's say Biden wins, is able to, to win Georgia, Georgia and, and, in and in Nevada. Nevada. So that so is, that is uh, 22, uh, 22 uh, uh, votes, right? So that only makes him reach to 259, right? right? So even with the split between uh, Maine and Nebraska, he doesn't reach anywhere close to 270. So he has to win some of those, um, some of those um, Rust Belt states, right? And, and, and those, um, Pennsylvania is not going to be called for a few days. Right. And, and we'll have to see what happens in Wisconsin and Michigan. Right. So as far as Biden is concerned, we see, suppose he gets Wisconsin, Michigan and Nevada, that still makes it 26 plus 6, 32. So that still gives him only uh, 269. 269. So then, then he... Then he's more or less, he just needs one more of One those of uh, Maine or Nebraska. Right. And he's probably going to get one of Maine or Nebraska. Right. right? He, he, he's just going to squeak through. It's going to be, the I think, the closest election in history. No, right. no there was actually a tie once. There was a tie once, yes. Uh, so, but it would be a, the, the narrowest of wins. Right. Um, but um, so of those three states on the top, that's Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Trump does need to. Sorry, Biden does need to win at least two. But if Biden doesn't get, um, uh, assuming he doesn't get Georgia, as if he doesn't get Georgia, then he has to get at least two of them. Right. Uh, without that, there is no part to it. Absolutely. So what we're seeing is that uh, it's uh, kind of crazy because also these states are the states which are going to really struggle with the. Counting as well, they're going to take some time. I think yeah. at least two of the states have already said that they're not going to finish it today. And maybe one of them may even go up till Friday. Uh-huh. So what we're seeing is that there is no real 
uh, we, we have a dangerous few uh, hours ahead with the possibility that Trump might even go to court. Yes. This, if, uh, yeah. And the, uh, on, the, uh, on the Senate side, now it's looking increasingly unlikely that the Democrats are going to uh, win a majority. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, Iowa has been called uh, for the Republicans. Uh, Montana, the Republicans are leading now. Um, uh, like, like was predicted, that the initial votes were from the Democratic areas and now the Republicans are leading. Uh, Maine is not looking good because with more than 50% vote counted, uh, Susan Collins, the Republican, has more than a 10% advantage. Interestingly, Biden has, is currently leading in Maine. So, so what it means is that if the same ballots have been counted, what it means is that Susan Collins is overperforming the Democrats by a significant margin, in right. which case they're going to lose that. Uh, North Carolina, they're behind. Georgia, they're behind. Um, Georgia special election is not going to be decided there. In, in that case, the only two seats they pick up are Colorado and possibly Arizona. Arizona well. So which only moves them to 48. They're, they're short of 50 by 2. And they lost one, so which is why they're 48. Yes, right. yes. So, 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 they, so they've lost Alabama. And, and so they, 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 they won Colorado, so those cancel out. They look like they might win Arizona, so that's plus one. And other than that, none of the other things right now look promising. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bapa. Like so <clears throat> that's all we have in today's Live with News Click and People's Dispatch. Uh, we started about one and a half hours ago, and the situation hasn't changed much. We'll be following the U.S. elections in the coming hours as well. We'll be doing shows today, tomorrow, so keep watching News Click and People's Dispatch for the latest to find out not only how this election is going to impact the United States, but also the rest of the world, what is going to be its impact on India, where we are closely identified with the Republican administration, what is going to happen with China, what's going to happen in West Asia, especially Iran, are we closer to a nuclear war, are we even closer to climate crisis, a lot of questions riding on this US election. So keep watching News Click and People's Dispatch and we'll be following this issue as well.